it's was not that disappointing? <laughs> <laughs> not at all. Not at all. I mean, uh, it, it's always good to see a face to the YouTube video because you have the genre of video where, uh, you know, you just put the pictures up and the animations already this early, dude, come on. The anim uh, your animations are incredible. I think you have a guy doing that, I suppose. But uh, yeah, it's a girl in England, actually. Uh, VR Lawrence. She does a great job. Love her. Always try to hype really? her. Really? Yeah. Have you ever met her? Uh, no, just by just by like a chat one time, just a video See, chat. That is so funny. Is uh, Kriegon from Kriegon's Dark World does the intros for Library of the Untold, and I've been I've been friends with him for years. Never met him in person though. Which is crazy. Yeah. But uh, the way I found your channel was uh, the abduction of Carl Higdon. Mm -hmm. And so I was watching the I've, – I've read about this story before, but, man, you I mean, you really brought it to life. And if anybody here is curious about that, check out uh, Think Anomalous and, and that particular video, which did really well for you for good reason. Mm -hmm. But at the end, you tied it together – with the missing 411 case, considering that, if, and correct me if I get this wrong, Higdon was dropped from the UFO, considering that allegedly he had a vasectomy and wasn't any good for what they needed to do. And then you had thought of, well, it seems as though a lot of the, the remains of people in missing 411 cases don't have footprints or tracks leading up to the body. Right. That is crazy to me. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. And there are many missing case, missing persons cases where just no body is found at all. Uh, right. Right. Completely vanish, you know, or, or just the boots are found or just a backpack or something like that. Right. Well, what amazes me about that is that, you know, I, I'm, I'm on like a, a, a valet's kick right now, but also on the side, I'm on a missing 411 kick as well. Uh, these two mm -hmm. subjects are, are very uh, intriguing to me. But I never thought about the two going hand in hand until I seen some of your videos. Right. Yeah, I mean, I, I got to credit David Pilates. He's the, the writer of the Missing 411 series. I have to credit him with that connection because it was him who made that connection in his, in his most recent documentary. Well, I got to credit you with the connection and everybody's got to and he's got to credit the victims with the connection. So everybody, <laughs> you know, full circle. But uh well, if uh, I would love to see a video by you uh, about the some of the missing four one one cases, dude. Uh, do Do you know about the uh, that three year old boy who was found on a branch in the middle of a swamp? Not you sure I know that one in particular. I've, I've heard so many stories, but yeah, go on. That that one is incredible because uh, the boy went missing from the campsite. Was missing for three days, right? Yeah, he was found. 10 or I'm going to get some of these details wrong, but 10 or so miles from where he went missing, mm -hmm. impossible for a three year old to take that, you know, right. so they, they suggested a cougar picked him up and took him, but they found him on a branch in the middle of a swamp, bone dry, mm -hmm. his clothes, his shoes, bone dry, and also no teeth marks or rips in his clothing. Right. And I mean, talk about a mystery. The problem is when they asked him questions, he was still three years old and right. didn't really do any good. But so what do you what do you think is going on with this Higdon having a vasectomy thing versus the people who go missing and don't, you know, don't show back up? I mean, it's really hard to say. The first thing I want to say is that Carl, it was, you know, it was Carl's assumption that it was because of his vasectomy that he was rejected. I uh, initially, I think when he first told the story, he had a different explanation. I actually can't remember what it was now. And it was just sort of later, he said, well, you know what, maybe it was because I had a vasectomy. The, the, the you know, the, um, the entities never told him that. So that, that's just an assumption. But right. that does come up in other stories. If you read some of David Pilates work, some, some people say they had some bizarre encounter with some sort of entity and were told that they weren't the right type or some kind of vague statement like that, or you're not what we're looking for, which is basically right. what they told Higdon. Um, I don't know. And, you know, and I, I don't know where they're, they're, they're supposed to be taken. I mean, it's a complete mystery. We really have no insight into it. Right. Well, it's fascinating that what Higdon said 
about the vasectomy ties right in with fairy lore, the reproduction program, and of course the hybridization program, allegedly by the Greys, of which his abductor was not a Grey unless in disguise. But that would go with what Valet is kind of assuming that they appear to us in a characteristic that we can understand. You know, so uh, Carl Higdon wasn't freaked out by his abductor. And what a what a better reason to appear a certain way to somebody. If if he had come into contact with a little gray man with big black eyes, he might have freaked out a little bit. But as you had said in your video, when the abductor asked him to come with him, Carl was like, why not? Mm-hmm. I, it's my day off work. <laughs> right. I got some time. I can't but say that's the same. It is a very odd reaction. I mean, you know, you're right. Maybe a gray alien would have been scarier, but... The aliens that he saw were, were plenty bizarre. Um, right. Usually out of, or, out of the ordinary. They're hovering off the ground, look very strange. I mean, you would think he would be afraid, but that's actually something that comes up in a lot of entity encounters and other paranormal encounters like ghost experience and things like that. People just feel this sense of calm kind of wash over them inexplicably, almost as if it's being sort of, you know, projected into them. I uh, see. You know, it's part of another process that uh, Valet called reality transformation. And another researcher named Jenny Randall's called the Oz Factor, which is just before an experience, everything seems to change. The air kind of feels different. The air feels heavier. You'll, you'll feel maybe an electric charge in the air. Things right. are quiet. You're in the middle of the woods and, and you don't hear the bugs anymore. And actually, that's something that Carl Higdon experienced. He said right. you know, he also didn't hear the birds. Right. So it's, just, it's almost as if your entire reality changes, right? And including your kind of inner state. And you just sort of enter this altered state of consciousness or this alternate reality where this experience takes place. It's kind of our equivalent of anesthesia whenever we've got work to do on a patient or an animal or something like that. Or in in certain cases, uh, you know, with animals, whenever we go to study animals, we have to, like, suppress their nature of rebellion in order to, you know, get what we're you know trying to get out of them, you know. And uh, and especially with Carl, and I like the way you introduced Carl in the video because it shows him, you know, he's working on an oil rig and he's an elk hunter. This is like a manly man's type dude. And mm-hmm. just looking at this guy right in the jawline, you can tell he's he's a no nonsense type of individual, you know, and sure. for his story to line up with all of these things that he was seemingly ignorant to, which. If I'm not mistaken, the year was, uh, it was in the 70s. 74, yeah. Right. So this is not something where he was able to necessarily gather up all kinds of different uh, different testimonies and, and put together. And even if that were the case, with that glass cube box that he reported and the being not having a chin but being humanoid, it's like if he did fake this, which... I don't think is the case at all. But if someone was to have that argument, why did he choose these strange details? You know, right. That, that, uh, that's something that's always the absurdity of a lot of these abduction cases, because, you know, he was healed, uh, his, his lungs, he had lymphedema, if if I'm not mistaken, which was was scarring, scarring on his, his, his lungs. Yeah. Right. And then after the abduction, he was healed of that. And so to me, that's enough evidence for in the lie detector tests, I realize are not necessarily uh, we don't go put all our, our eggs in all that basket, you know. Sure. But I mean, with the scar tissue in his lungs being healed, we know something did happen. And then the details of his testimony being so bizarre and so abstract, it's like, Something something happened here, you know. We just don't know what or why. Right. He was trying to come up with a cover story for something. There were there were much more believable stories he could have told. <laughs> <laughs> That's my favorite thing about the Travis Walton case is that whenever they were accusing his co-workers of murder, they said that the UFO story was a cover story for them. Mm-hmm. And they were like, dude. Yeah. They're, yeah, they were, they were logging in the middle of the woods. I mean, they could have easily just said, oh, we accidentally cut him with a chainsaw or a tree fell on him, right? It would have been so much easier or whatever. Right. They just wandered off and got attacked by a wild animal or something. Right, right. They wiped him up with all that. So yeah. uh, what do you think about uh, Travis Walton? He recently came out saying that uh, 
he wasn't abducted on purpose, that they didn't come after him, that in fact the only reason they took him in was to repair the damage that had been done mistakenly because he got too close. Yeah, I mean, that's that's interesting. Um, that It doesn't really gel with what I know about UFO encounters or what I you know, what I, how I interpret UFO encounters, I tend to believe that, you know, these experiences were kind of meant for that person, you know, um, that they're kind of tailored to that person for God knows what purpose. Right. Uh, but no one's just sort of in the wrong place at the wrong, at the wrong time. Um, now, you know, obviously that's how he feels about it. And, you know, he's the one who, who experienced it. So we got to kind of uh, take his word for it, I suppose. But right. It's, it's that, you know, he was returned alive. And they didn't necessarily take any, they didn't have him reproduce with a hybrid female, like a lot of these cases. And it it makes me think because the whole idea, okay, because so reading confrontations, which I'm not very far in yet, it seems that there's a heinous, uh, oh, but I should hold it up for everybody. I just started this one because I have not yet been able to purchase a passport to Magonia which is the OG work, but this one is dark. It's very yeah. dark. Yeah. And I mean, the, the, for any of the ladies out there who are into, you know, murder mystery Monday, but at the same time, you know, interested in UFOs, that's the middle ground right there. Sure. So it seems like they have a dark agenda. Sure. But my, if there's multiple species of these beings, so to speak, or multiple spirits, so to speak, or even, let's say someone did stumble upon something that they weren't meant to see. It it makes me feel like the agenda is neither good nor bad, but just something so abstract that we can't really wrap our minds around it, you know? Right. I mean, yeah, I do want to say just up front, you know, yes, Vale has a whole book on, you know, negative uh, experiences, including some experiences where where someone seems seems to have been killed by a UFO or an entity. But I, right. I do want to say, and I think even Vale acknowledges in the book, that is a, a small minority of cases. I mean, it, is that it, so? Yeah, no, it, I didn't know that. Uh, you know, yeah, people getting killed is pretty rare. But then again, you know, you take in the missing 411 cases and we have all these cases, thousands and thousands of cases of people just going missing or winding up dead. You know, yeah. and, and those cases are completely unexplained. So if we assume that all those cases were at some point UFO encounters or entity encounters, well, then that drives up the body count a lot, right? Right. Um, That's true. That that would be guilt by association and correlation, not causation. Right. I mean, it's just kind of like a bias in the data. I mean, the people, if there are people being taken away forever to a different planet or a different dimension or killed or whatever, then obviously we're never going to see them again. And we're never going to hear their story. Right. right. So... Yes, if a lot of people are being killed, then those are the cases we're not hearing about. The only cases we are hearing about are the ones where people are returned, right? Right. So we really can't say how many people die as a result of these experiences. So how would you compare those cases with the the stark contrast, for example, uh, in Zimbabwe, the aerial school incident, which is, I mean, it's my favorite case because it's irrefutable. How many psychologists came through and said, children cannot lie like this Mm -hmm. and multiple children ain't happening. So it's like the the message to their children uh, for, I mean, fans of both of our channel uh, are know the story that it was meant to teach the children to grow up, to become more caring for one another and the earth, which Mm -hmm. is the exact opposite of say, like, in Brazil, that farmer who had holes drilled into his body and was completely drained of blood. You're like, what, what's going on here? Because I, I feel like whenever, whenever I was younger, I was fishing and, uh, and I accidentally, I, I snagged a cat. Don't even, I don't think I, I was casting. I forgot the details of how it happened, but he was messing around with the bait and it got him in the lip. Mm-hmm. And I had to de-hook a, a fishing hook from a cat's lip. He's clawing, scratching, freaking out. Yet I was trying to help. Right. You know what I'm saying? Yep. Yeah. Or, you know, I like to use the analogy of, you know, uh, when biologists go out into the wilderness and, you know, tranquilize a chimpanzee or something and bring him into the lab. All of a sudden that chimpanzee is going to wake up 
and there's all these strange people working on him with these strange instruments for unknown purposes. They're Do right. something to his body, cut him up. Who knows what he doesn't know what's going on. And right. Also he's released back into the wilderness. Well, how right. does that chimpanzee make sense of that experience? Were they trying to help me? Were they trying to hurt me? Who even knows? It was terrifying. Even if they were trying to help him, it was a terrifying experience with a lot of pain. Right. Right. Um, and then, you know, and we don't try to go down to the level of the chimpanzee and explain to the chimpanzee what we were doing. We just assume, well, it's just a dumb animal. Who cares what they think? Right. So there seems to be that parallel with this higher intelligence treating us like we treat animals. That throwing us back into the wild again and, and leaving it up to us to make sense of the experience. Dude, that, it, yeah. gives, it gives me chills thinking about it because we don't know that we send monkeys to space and they die and we're doing it for the good of humanity. Right. right. Zoos. Yeah. No, but it's an interesting point. You know, are, are these experiences, are they meant to help us? Are they meant to hurt us? Are they neither? I mean, you know, there's, there's as many answers as there are cases. Um, and, you know, many people have, have pointed this out that, yes, there does seem to be some benevolent encounters and there does seem to be some distinctly malevolent encounters and there seem to be everything in between. Um, I would draw, again, comparison to something I think you talk about on your channel a lot, um, psychedelic experiences, psilocybin yeah. experiences, DMT experiences. Read some DMT experiences. Some people are terrified. They encounter alien beings. They're they're raped. They're they're assaulted, mauled. Um, other people will have you know distinctly uh, uh, you know positive experiences. Right. Other people have something that's just sort of ambiguous. But in the end, I think most people that undergo those experiences would say that they grew from them in some way or another. Right. Right. Even if it's acknowledging something negative about reality that they didn't necessarily want to acknowledge. Uh, even if it was an extremely terrifying experience, sometimes you got something from it. Uh, yeah. Uh, so as a, as an avid, well, not anymore uh, so much, but you make a really good point. And I, I could tie that right back to Higdon, that his abduction, if you ask me, seems like a really long DMT trip. Now, so that begs the question of endogenous DMT. And what it can do in the bloodstream under certain circumstances, you know, because the way he said his bullet left the gun in slow motion. That's, I mean, that's, that's got DMT all over it. Uh, the way that that cube uh, and, and I mean, really just everything about the experience. But and, and you make a good point because uh, the DMT entities are not necessarily good or necessarily evil. And I've met both in, in frequent cases where. Uh, I mean, there's a gray area as well, but I mean, you you got some things that seem like they're intentionally trying to harm you. You got mm -hmm. some things that are just pranksters, of course, trying to mess with you, you know, but mm -hmm. then you got some that are it, it very intense on trying to help you and humanity as a whole. Right. So it's like it, it, this is either outside of our understanding completely or. There's multiple. Let me ask you this. Have you ever heard of an encounter where an abductee was warned by their abductors about another species or another civilization? I can't think of any off the top of my head. No, Neither can I. Uh, I obviously not saying it doesn't happen. Um, very well could. Right. But, yeah. You'd think that would be the case if there was two different species or multiple species. You know, you hear all these conspiracies about the Draco reptilians versus the uh, Arcturians. Mm -hmm. you, but that might be us projecting our idea of good and evil. Everything in our reality, we seem to do that way. Democrat, Republican, black versus white, hot versus cold. We seem to say it's either this or it's either that. Right. And that's where I think Jung and Valet seem to step in really gracefully and say, mm -hmm. quit categorizing these things, you know? Right. Yeah, I mean, that's a, a, an important point, I would say, is, you know, I've read so many UFO encounters, so many abduction experiences, entity encounters, and almost every single one involves a different being. Yes, there are a lot of cases where people see, you know, the, the, the classic gray alien. Right. Um, but then there's there's people that see kind of variations on the gray alien, like the Betty and Barney Hill abduction in 1961, one of the kind of first well-publicized abductions. Right. They saw it, beings that were very similar to grays, but didn't have the big, you know, the big dome of the head. 
And I think, right. you know, large eyes, but not almond shaped and not necessarily slanted, but just, right. a, you know, a slight tweak on that. Um, well, you know, think about, I mean, all, all humans look different too, you know, yeah. I'm yeah. sorry, but yeah, go ahead. But yeah. So, and the other important point, and this is something that Valet brought up, that there seems to be a lot of deception in these cases. People are told specific things, uh, you know, predictions for the future, uh, you know, warnings of things that are going to happen, um, that, you know, don't come to fruition. Uh, for example, you know, the uh, Zanfretta abduction, an Italian guy named Pierre Fortunato Zanfretta in the 70s, late 70s, early 80s, there were several abductions over several years. And they're basically these giant green, like 10 foot tall green beings that looked a lot, by the way, like the creature of the Black Lagoon. Right. And it, it almost, seemed, you know, just, yeah. Some might say and, reptilians. Sure. Yeah. <clears throat> they had, you know, gills on their, on their uh, necks, just like the creature in the Black Lagoon. But anyway, he was told all sorts of things. You know, they, they, uh, details are sketchy in my head now, but, you know, they told him that they were going to come back several times. They gave him this box and hid it in this cave and said that they were going to come back for it. They said that they're going to do this landing and like introduce themselves to humanity. And they just did after a certain point, the abductions just stopped and none of that right. came true. And that box, he never found again. He went up to the mountains looking for it, looking for that cave where they supposedly hid it, never found it. Right. You know, I, I, as far as I know, the guy's still alive today and, and has had no more experiences. So what was right. that all about? You know, were, right. did they have a plan for him and they just abandoned it or were they just lying to him the whole time? So yeah. this idea of deception, um, it it, it, it kind of ties back to, and I and I saw a video of yours uh, about uh, uh, air airships, uh, the hot air balloon looking things that also ties into all another story that you brought to life about the sailor that climbed from a flying ship like a boat, and then he swam down. Mm -hmm. And uh, and by the way, that video that story has been covered by many YouTube channels. Yours is, I swear, I've looked all over the place. Yours is the only one who covered the original case. Right. One of my favorite channels, Mr. Mythos, actually covers a latter case of that, a retelling of that. So yeah. to see yours and be like, dude, he got the OG case and reported on that out all well, the way. Thank but, you. Yeah. But I mean, well, so these airships, uh, it, it, it's always in sync with what we can comprehend mm -hmm. i mean is that do you think that's on purpose by their intent or do you think we are projecting yeah i mean that that's kind of the old debate but i certainly think that that's on purpose i think that's the way that they appear i mean you know a, a certain amount of variance can be explained by you know just what we're projecting what we expect to see or you know people make the point that you know, if you don't have the technological frame of reference to understand a certain technology, you're just not going to understand that technology and you're going to see something that does make sense to you. So, for right. example, the, the mystery airship phenomenon, 1896 to 1897, people saw things that, you know, had flapping wings on them, you know, what we call ornithopters or, uh, you know, flying with just weird propellers and fins and fishtails and all sorts of bizarre technologies that, you know, never proved to work as flying right. machines and could not possibly have worked based on, you know, our, our current understanding of physics. Right. So, you know, you could make the argument, okay, well, those were just the technologies that were familiar to those people. So they really saw, you know, sleek silver saucers like we see today and just sort of projected all these contraptions on them. But I don't think that's a very great explanation. Well, uh, have you have you seen the cave paintings of, of UFOs that are flying turtles? I don't think I've seen those in particular, but I've seen a lot of interesting Old art, so, yeah. I mean, you know, that I mean, to, it's almost a devil's advocate with what you're saying, of course, but I mean, it's it's where it's worth noting. But I mean, at the same time, to go along with what you're saying, they didn't just draw flying turtles. They also drew insectoids with antennas coming out of their heads with, you know, sometimes mm -hmm. they drew grays like straight up. And, and uh, in Australia, they do, you know, they drew grays uh, on uh, the, the uh, Wanjinda is what they called them. You know, and then they had the ant people, uh, the Hopi had the ants, ant people. It, it's, it's got grays written all over it. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it, it, it's a good argument because I, I want to go down that path of Jung, where it's like we're projecting our own ideas onto something abstract, like a, a Rorschach test, right? Like an inkblot test, right? Sure, yeah. But the anomalies that don't fit that narrative are so abundant 
that you you can't you can't pinpoint it down to that you know the absurdities are too much to stick with that yeah i mean you know to, to give credit to young uh, he did acknowledge the physical reality of ufos early in his book and by the way i should have got that one right here book flying saucers all right which one do you got hey all right different hey, we got different covers though all right i got the hard cover that's the real one oh <laughs> man <laughs> You yeah. got me beat on this one. Sorry usually I win. Usually with my guests, I win the wars on which one who's got the newest book. <laughs> right. <laughs> but anyway, so he does acknowledge very early in the book. He's like, you know, yes, these things. And by the way, this book was written in 1958. So right. it's a long time ago. Right. Um, and, and, you know, American society was just kind of. So he does acknowledge that, yes, there's, there's many instances where UFOs are caught on radar. There's many instances where they leave, you know, physical traces on the ground, this and that. Clearly, there's some physical component to this. But he also acknowledges you know, in a seemingly paradoxical fashion, that there's a very, very, very strong subjective component to this. And clearly, you know, um, that the way they appear, you know, has, has kind of deep resonance with our, you know, subjective uh, experiences and understanding. So, you know, he wasn't necessarily able to resolve that paradox, right. but he did acknowledge that. And I think that was, you know, that was an important step. How do you feel about Jung being... And I and uh, by the way, I say this being the biggest fan of Jung. I am a fanboy of Jung, like a teenage girl for NSYNC in oh, 1992. Yeah. Okay, That's let me great. be clear. Yeah, but he is frankly rude while interpreting some of the abduction scenarios of some of these people. Uh, 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 I, uh, quoting he, at one point, he was like, "Well, maybe Freud is right about some of these sexual repressions." I mean, borderline mocking. He called uh, the one guy naive in his own mm. introspection. And I'm, I'm like, okay, I love Jung, but if this really happened to this guy right. and Jung is interpreting his experience as psychological naivety, mm. I'm like, damn, bro, that's, that's very rude. So maybe he was trying to express being professional about it to avoid skepticism, but that's not, that's not like Jung. He was on the outskirts, you know? Yeah. Also famously kind of ambivalent on the paranormal, though. I mean, he, he talked about it a lot, but would right. never kind of come out and say that it was definitely true. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, I think it very well could have just been him kind of navigating the academy. You know, at that time, people were getting very uncomfortable with the paranormal or the supernatural or anomalous phenomena, whatever you want to call it. Uh, it was, you know, kind of just, you know, you could get ostracized. You can get mar marginalized for coming straight out and saying that you believed in that stuff. Right. So maybe that was just sort of him playing the game trying to acknowledge it, trying to include it in his worldview and his interpretation without coming out and saying that, yes, it's definitely true. I don't know. But he does seem to have a lot of insights, for sure. Uh, absolutely. Uh, I mean, the book and his whole take on it is valuable when studying the human reaction to these anomalous events. But, you know, at the same time, it's like he glorified the people who had dreams about UFOs and reported on their dreams with great stature. Meanwhile, the people who had actual encounters, he uh, drug them through the mud. And it's almost, it was almost heartbreaking for me considering I'm like, dude, you wrote red book. Like, don't yeah. like, don't, you know, don't do that to other people who have had frankly, similar experiences as he did when he was in his twenties, you know, mm -hmm. but, uh, so I didn't know it was so uh, Jung on flying saucers was written in 58. Yes. But the UFOs over Washington, though, that was 1952. Yep. Did he just straight up ignore that whole thing? Uh, yeah, I'm not sure if he ever referenced that. that directly. He didn't. But he, again, he did recognize re reference, uh, you know, a radar case. Radar. So that, you know, that may have been where he was drawing that from. So this is kind of disheartening because I'm doing a video right now. Me and Kriegon are working on a video called Highway to Magonia, mm -hmm. where uh, the intro is the 1952 DC, spoiler alert, everybody. And then it goes into the little twist of it is, well, Carl didn't know about this particular incident considering his reports were before that. Now mm -hmm. I'm over here like, oh, no. We might have to uh, put a disclaimer on that little tidbit because I didn't know how late in the game of his life that book was published. Yeah. And you also have to remember at that time. So at that time, the U.S. government had Project Blue Book in operation, which was their UFO investigation group. 
uh, started in some form in, in 47 under a different name. Uh, and, and Blue Book ran right till 1969, 1970, by the time it was terminated. And at that point in the 50s, you know, there had been landing cases reported to, to Project Blue Book, but the people at Project Blue Book just could not wrap, wrap their heads around that. They just thought that was so absurd that they wouldn't even acknowledge them. So they just had a default policy of just ignoring landing cases. Anyone who said they saw an alien, anyone who said they saw a flying saucer land and anything come out, straight up ignored. Um, That's a so, common problem in science. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It just was too far outside their kind of uh, frame of reference. So, you know, to be fair to Jung, he probably wasn't reading a lot of those because they just weren't being collected and they weren't being reported. Right. That's a good point. I, it reminds me of how Valet was in a, he was an aspiring astronomer mm -hmm. and he dismissed the idea of UFOs because he was like, well, uh, if there were UFOs, this is early. Mm -hmm. uh, if there were UFOs, astronomers would see them. Mm -hmm. And and obviously th that would be the thing. But whenever he became an astronomer, he he saw he saw the, he was like, dude, they're just not reporting on it. And they were like, yeah, we don't report on that when we see it. Mm -hmm. If you want to keep your job. And yeah. he was like. Bro, this is not science. Mm -hmm. this, uh, we have abandoned the scientific method completely. Yeah. And he had an experience when he was working as an astronomer, I think as a quite a young man, uh, maybe probably in his 20s or something. Um, yeah. He mentions this in his, in his journals, which are published now, that they did actually track an object. I think it was an object circling the Earth um, uh, in some way. And I actually can't remember the technology they used to actually track it. I don't, it wasn't radar or something else. This, this wasn't the Black Knight satellite, was it? Um, I'm not sure what that is, but basically, you know, they, they, they recorded this object and everyone was kind of talking about saying, wow, what is this thing? And he said, someone just came in and deleted the tape and walked out and said, that's it. End of, end of story. They just didn't want to know, you know, like. Dude, I, he, I'm literally, I'm, I'm stressed out just <laughs> hearing that. Yeah. Like how far behind are we now because right. of that alone? Right. Yeah. But, you know. All this stuff we're talking about kind of does tie into another really important insight Valet had. Uh, and it's something you referenced earlier when you said the absurdity of it all. That these, these uh, and you know, we talked about the deceit, that these experiences seem to present themselves in a way that that almost like it defies our, our, our belief, like almost kind of forces us to disbelieve it because it's so absurd, right? And you got these bizarre looking aliens telling these crazy stories and uh, you know, making predictions for the future and talking about all these crazy things that, you know, even the person who experienced it will kind of doubt their own experience. Say, well, that couldn't have been. This was so bizarre. This must have been a dream or I must be crazy. And of course, if you feel that way, you're not going to go tell other people. I mean, if you hardly believe your own experience, you're not going to go out to the public and say, hey, everybody, listen to what happened to me and then rattle off all these wild experiences. Right. Right. And I do think, I, and Valet thought, and I also think that that is part of the phenomenon, that it kind of conceals itself. It engages in its own cover-up. By presenting itself to us in such a bizarre way, it kind of forces everybody to keep it to themselves. And I actually yeah. do think that that's another fundamental part of the phenomenon, that it's meant for you and you alone, right? Yeah. People always ask the question, well, if this thing, you know, if, the, if, if these aliens were real, these experiences are real, why don't they land on the White House lawn, shake the hand of the president, announce themselves on live TV and tell everyone? Well, simply because that's not what they want to do. Right. You know, they want to challenge you. They want to kind of make you question reality. They want you to question your own uh, sanity, question psyche, the nature of consciousness, right. the nature of the universe, all these things. And I think when you it, it present something to someone in such a bizarre way, that, that, you know, it's naturally conducive to those kind of questions. And I, I think ultimately that's what they're after. For, for what purpose, I don't know, but they definitely want us to question reality. That that is uh, staggeringly poignant, considering that we know damn well that telling telling someone to keep their mouth shut about something is completely futile. In fact, it'll work the reverse. Yeah. But if you make if you gaslight them, however, they will hesitate with everything else in their life whatsoever. It makes you wonder how often these things happen that people just don't speak up. You know, uh, the old stereotype used to be before John Mack was that um, why and still in, I'm, I work in construction. And so this 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 stigma still exists. They say, well, if they're really abducting people, 
why don't why do they only abduct these hillbilly farmers right, right. with no teeth and they're not they're wearing overalls with no t-shirt under them and they got ah, right, they're chewing mm -hmm. right and but the answer to that is no those are the guys willing to talk about it mm -hmm. and john mack unveiled to us as a psychiatrist who specialized in anonymous people who if you're the ceo of um rise coffee i don't know uh you're not going to come forward about these things but you are going to need help so you contact John Mack, you know, well, before he was killed, allegedly. So it, it makes you realize that this might, might be frequent. And, you know, I had a guest on my show uh, uh, who uh, uh, she had the channel um, Compounding Infinity. And, uh, and I talked to her and she, she is an abductee by all means. Mm -hmm. And before I actually spoke with her in depth, I'll be honest with you. I didn't believe her. Hmm. And then the reason I realized later, the reason I didn't believe her is because I was talking to her in person. If her story was in a book reported by Valet, I'd have believed her. Hmm. And that goes to show you, I too am guilty of the stigma. After speaking with her in depth about it, I realized that I was biased about the whole thing. Basically, because I've never seen one, I feel like no one else has. How right. ignorant can a person be, especially after years of DMT? What right. am I thinking, you know? Right. But it's not just bias. That's actually like kind of a fundamental epistemological stance where you're saying, well, I only trust things that come from a book, right? That, that some authority has to kind of dictate it to me. Whereas right. that's not, again, that's not the way the UFO phenomenon operates. If it right. wanted to operate that way, it easily could. It could go to... Putin and, and Xi Jinping and, and, and Biden, you know, the, the authorities of the world and have them disseminate the message. They choose not to do that. They choose to go, like you said, to random people, working class people on the outskirts of society and just introduce themselves to thousands of people, really. There's something like 10,000 UFO um, sightings a year. Right. Um, so they're introducing themselves to thousands of people on an individual level um, and, and always kind of going for these low status people not to say that high status people don't also have experiences i mean there's yeah I, I, that have experiences as well i haven't read on it yet but i was getting ready to delve into uh people with a high level of income and their abduction cases mm -hmm. apparently frequently more rare but the reason they're more rare allegedly is because of they whenever a rich person needs help with what they've seen they mm -hmm. get the help Right. They don't have to go public about it, but right. it does happen to them too. However, I don't have a shred of evidence on that considering my own income. But, right. uh, <laughs> but it, I mean, it's, it is, it's worth noting, you know, but I, I like where you're going with this about it being personal to that particular person, because in fairy lore, as Graham Hancock had been talking about, it rings true. The changelings and the greys, they, they, there's a lot in common there. But um, the, it, they, the fairies wanted individual people to know that there was more to the world than their biological senses could pick up on. That right. seems to resonate with what you're saying about it being personal. Right. And I also think, again, it's just kind of an epistemological statement they're making. They're, they're saying reality isn't defined by authorities. Reality is defined right. by direct experience, you no know, sense. and you don't need an authority to tell you how the universe works. Right. Uh, you know, you got to listen to your neighbor and your neighbor will say, well, hey, I experienced this crazy thing. It may right. not make sense to you, but it happened to me. And if, I feel like if you talk to people like that and you accept what people are telling you, obviously some people lie, some people make up stories, but on the whole, people are honest and you'll have a much richer understanding of how the universe works if you actually listen to people. Right. You're right. That, that, there's a huge misconception and skepticism about the whole people lie thing. Um, mm -hmm. Whenever people lie, it comes out. They sure. lie wrong and, mm -hmm. it, and it fucks their whole shit up. And mm -hmm. that happens a lot. But right. all of the cases where someone is lying, it ends up coming to fruit that they were lying. And there's no way around that. A lie is a lie. And in, the, in a world of uh, like a more subtle realm of truth, those things come out. And it's it's almost like the person sabotages themselves eventually, 
Right. But in the case they usually that, try to exploit it too, right? There's usually some financial incentive they're trying to get book deals or whatever. Well, you see in a lot of these UFO abductee cases, is a lot of times people don't even want to talk to the media. I'm thinking right. of the, you know, the Kelly Hopkinsville encounter in 1955, um, you know, inundated with with media attention only because they they went to the police. They were so freaked out about their encounter, and the media kind of caught wind. I think, uh, if I recall correctly, one of the the family members chopped down a tree and, and threw the tree over top of the driveway so people couldn't drive in. Like, that's how bad they wanted people not to come around. So they were not trying to capitalize on the experience. Nobody nobody made a dime on it, right? Right. That that's ah. Uh... And well, even in certain cases where people, some people do make a little bit of money, but I've argued before that that's what you would do too. And by you, I mean me, yeah. like, I mean, all of us, uh, sure. and, uh, everyone I think knows about the, it's, there's a, Brazil is all over the place with UFOs. First of all, mm -hmm. Brazil is the spot, right? Yeah. Yeah. But the girls who saw the being in Brazil, uh, recently, I think it was 1996. I might've might get the date wrong mm -hmm. but um the uh the the encounter where the gray there was two grays running around one of them was injured the one needed help spoke telepathically that it needed help or whatever the girl saw it several other people saw it too but the girls saw it mm -hmm. and eventually uh, the news media people were offering money to talk to the girls what are the girls supposed to do say yeah. no right right yeah, of course you're gonna take that. Yeah. I take the money, take the money. But skeptics come out here and say, "Oh, they got, they made, they made money." Mm -hmm. It's like, dude, the world runs off of money. That's yeah. that's gonna be yeah. part of it. But and the skeptics Hopkins make lots world, of money too, by the way. But yeah, it ain't, yeah, it wasn't much. But like in Hopkinsville, they avoided uh, media coverage, as you said. Like they put that branch in front of the road. They were sick of people stopping by. All they wanted to do was report to the authorities. That something had happened because they needed help, right. you know, uh, which actually reminds me, uh, you brought up in a couple videos now of yours about owls mm -hmm. um, in both Hopkinsville, Mothman Encounters and um, Flatwoods. Flatwoods Monster. Yep. Where do you stand <laughs> on that now, years later? Um, well, the owl thing was was just introduced as a as an explanation by skeptics right is that what you're referring to oh no but, I'm, I'm i want your fresh take on it because in your videos you do a great job of being not biased on either side and you mm -hmm. give a fair argument to the people talking about owls right i want to know where you personally stand on owls you know uh, well, you know, in those cases in particular, I think, you know, skeptics offering skeptics trying to claim that these witnesses just saw owls and misinterpreted them as aliens, I think is ridiculous. Um, but it, I'm not sure if this is what you're getting at, but there are lots of uh, what's called screen memories of abductees claiming to see owls and then having these kind of bizarre experiences, missing time, and then kind of going back through regression, hypnosis or other processes and realizing, oh, wait a minute, that wasn't an owl that was a gray alien or that was an alien of some form. Well, so that's not what I was referring to, but that's, I, that's what I was getting ready to kind of okay. right. deviate into. I mean, so like what I was asking you was about the skeptics who say, okay, say in Flatwoods, mm -hmm. they say that they saw an owl because it floated towards them and right. it was screeching. However, yeah. they, they described it as being metallic and giving off a mist, and that doesn't really line up, you know. And it was a military man uh, who saw this uh, Flatwoods monster. And, and, it, so, and also the owl thing doesn't really work with uh, the, uh, the Hopkinsville case either, considering that they were walking around and, uh, and they, they could jump or whatever. And they were so, and they were shooting at them, and uh, several times the the witness said, "Well, we we shot it, we heard it, we heard the the um, the buckshot hit them, and it made thing. it sound like a metallic bucket." Yeah. So right. and I mean they were terrorized all night. I think it was the whole total experience. I think was five hours long or something. Like the idea that four or five owls would just repeatedly attack this house, you know, and and kind of withstand gunshots and things is pretty ridiculous. All right. So uh, Eric here says that owls don't screech. I didn't. I'll, I'll have to look into that. Maybe, maybe he's right. Uh, I know they say who or whatever, but I, I was under the impression that all birds could do a screech or whatever. That's an interesting point, and thank you very much. But, I mean, so so let's uh, rewind a little bit to uh, owls 
kind of being an omen. This is a long recorded, I mean, I'm talking about prehistory and even in conspiracies today, secret societies, even uh, the people who run, I dare to say, this whole shit have a fascination with owls. What do you think is going on with the owls as being like an omen or even worship sometimes? Uh, I, I really can't comment on that. I don't know a whole lot about it, but certainly Say. there's rich symbolism there, right? Uh, owl is kind of a symbol of, of wisdom. Uh, you know, owls appear frequently in ancient mythology as well, like owl of Minerva and all these things. Um, and I guess, you know, to tie it back to where we, what we were talking about, I do think that there is a lot of kind of mythology in UFO encounters. Um, right. So could be a connection there. That's kind of where I, uh, my hypothesis was a while ago with, um, despite the absurdities and the anomalies is that, you know, it, it, people who drew on cave walls saw flying turtles, people in, uh, re, uh, religious times, uh, saw uh, what the new, new Nuremberg uh, sighting. They saw religious symbols in the sky, crosses and halos. Mm -hmm. um, then you, you fast forward to medieval times and you have fairies with chariots of fire. Uh, and then you have even like not so long ago, just yesteryear, you know, the 50s, 60s and 70s, these crafts were kind of cheesy with blinking colored lights and legs, tripods, the way that like uh, the the creature of the Black Lagoon, you know, was pop culture back then. And the guy happened to see something similar to that. And then you fast forward to today and we the UFOs of today, they look sleek, like they look like iPhones, like they look like a PS 15 or whatever. You know, it seems to match our expectations. Right. They look like they were designed by Steve Jobs, basically. Right. <clears throat> yeah, and I think that's an incredibly important point. And I mean, I think that's kind of, you know, one of Ballet's central points is, um, I mean, first of all, you know, Ballet was kind of one of the first guys to go back into history and try to find UFO encounters before 1947. For, the, right. for those of you who don't know, the kind of modern UFO um, era started in 1947. A guy named uh, Kenneth Arnold had a sighting near, near Mount Rainier, Washington, reported it to the, to the Air Force. And it kind of started what was called the flying saucer frenzy. And then the, the Roswell event supposedly happened soon after that. And it just kind of, it, it, you know, it went everywhere in Western media. And then all of a sudden, you know, all Western countries were seeing UFOs. And, you know, people finally had kind of a name for it. So they were starting to call it out and talk about it and whatnot. So a lot of people got caught up in that and said, okay, well, the reason, you know, there's this sudden kind of wave of UFO sightings is because it just started. Maybe, you know, the aliens just got here. They just flew here in 1947. And now they're visiting regularly. Ballet was kind of one of the first guys to go, okay, well, maybe, or maybe, you know, maybe that's just sort of when we, we recognize the phenomenon. How, right. how old is the phenomenon truly? And, you know, he started going back into history and finding all these, these experiences that were very similar to UFO sightings or UFO landings or entity encounters, um, but aesthetically different. So people didn't see, you know, gray aliens, they didn't see flying saucers, spinning saucers or whatever else. Um, but they did see, you know, for example, balls of light. Right. Uh, they didn't meet entities. They were, you know, abducted. They didn't necessarily use that term. Um, but people were abducted by fairies quite frequently. There are many medieval reports of, you know, kind of people being taken to this alternate world and returned again. He was kind of the first one to say, you know, well, maybe there's kind of a continuity of experiences throughout history. And it's just simply the aesthetic details that change. So the, the entities look different uh, according to the time period. The, the vessels they travel in look different according to the time period. And crucially, they always appear to us in a way that sort of fits within our technological or spiritual frame of reference, right? Right. So, you know, for example, there's a, one of the earliest videos I ever did, um, the abduction of Jacob Jacobson or Jacob yeah. Jacobson in uh, Sweden in 1759. And we know this, this was just recorded in a, in a parish record by, by, by the local priest or the local minister. And uh, it's just very interesting. Uh, basically, really quickly, guy goes in a boat. Uh, goes across the lake that he was very familiar with, comes back to the other side of the lake again, and all of a sudden there's this mansion there. There's this pathway with this big house that you know had never been there before. He walks into the house. There's all these little short beings kind of milling about. There's this sort of um, dwarf-like creature with this red hat on. This woman comes up to him. This beautiful woman comes up to him, offering uh, food and drink on this tray. He refuses. Eventually starts praying to Jesus to bring him back because he's kind of freaked out. 
and this this entity in the red hat says something like, "Oh, he's got an ugly mouth. Throw him out." And right. then, boom, just like that, he's back to his regular reality. Right. He wanders back to his town, only to find out he's been missing for four days. Right. I think it was four days or five days. Um, no one knows where he was that whole time. And it, even though his in his experience, it was, you know, a 20-minute experience. Right. Well, you know, you look at that and you say, okay, well, it's got, you know, short little goblin creatures and dwarves and whatnot, and it's a house, not a ship. But it's very, very similar to the Travis Walton abduction. Travis yeah. Walton was, was missing for four or five days, even though he only remembers, you know, 20 minutes aboard the ship. So you just kind of sub out, you know, a spaceship for a house, a dwarf for an alien, and you've got almost the same experience, right? Right. So it reminds me of uh, like a like a video game where, I mean, so if if I was to enter a video game that was like, say, Pac-Man, I would have to I would have to become a another Pac-Man, whatever those things are called, whereas I couldn't enter Pac-Man as Kratos from God of War or whatever is I don't really know. Sonic mm-hmm. the Hedgehog, whatever you want. Um, however, I could not enter the world of God of War as Pac-Man. That also would not fit the coding, the code of that particular video game. And and sometimes I wonder if that's how they interact with not our world, objectively speaking, but consciousness, mm-hmm. subjectively speaking, you know, uh, being personal to each individual, you know. And that kind of ties into the DMT thing as well. Jacob Jacobson. It, it, it screams DMT all over it, you know, mm-hmm. and it makes me wonder because we know that it is endogenous to the lungs, liver and pineal gland. But can that build up in someone's system and then spill over one day causing these experiences? Right. I don't know. And if that is the case, how does that explain, you know, uh, spontaneous healing? And in many cases, how does that explain, you know, someone getting holes bored, drilled into their bodies, right. you know, on the, on, the, on the other side of it, you know, I don't think DMT can do that, you know. Right. So the, it, it's really, I mean, it's just all speculation. The only thing we know for sure is that there is something happening. Mm hmm. Kind of a disturbing notion to be left with so many questions, knowing that there is something going on, and the answer might be completely outside of our entire vocabulary, you know? Right. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I don't think they want us to have an answer. I mean, that's that's something I've always you know struggled with. I, I got interested in UFOs, oh man, 13 years ago or so now, you right. know, when I first I, I, you know, I, at first when I started reading about these cases, I, you know, was very much in favor of the extraterrestrial hypothesis, the nuts and bolts explanation. These are biological entities getting in physical craft and traveling from one planet to our planet, you know. Right. Um, and, it ends know, up I, too I, easy. Yeah. And I thought, okay, there's got to be a way to rationalize this. All, all this has to make sense. You know, we can compare all cases and, and you know determine which races are visiting us and what planets they're coming from and whatever, and what their purpose is. But the more and more cases I read, the more I realized, man, these these cases are all over the map. You know, there seems to be every purpose you could think of is expressed. Every alien creature you could imagine is visited us. Every spaceship that comes is different. Uh, And they all seem to work at different purposes. And, you know, they could so easily explain their, their, their objectives to us and they just choose not to. I mean, you kind of, eventually you have to accept that, that, you know, they don't want us to know. Right. And again, I do think that's an important part of the phenomenon, that it, it does leave you with questions. I think that's sort of the goal, you know, right? Um, make you question your reality. Uh, it, you know? it, once you know that there is something else, you tend to look at everything that is mundane a little bit differently. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, that that also rings true with the DMT experience as well, because. DMT is kind of disclosure that everything is a, uh, is a miracle, mm-hmm. you know, and, you know, whenever science comes out and says everything can be explained mm-hmm. and, and you go, hey, wait a second, because, you know, how science is, you know, they, they do the, you know, we want one free miracle. That is the mm-hmm. Big Bang. One free mm-hmm. miracle. And we can we and can we'll explain, explain the rest, rest of it. Yeah. yeah. Was, that Ter- was that Terrence McKenna? That's, ter- that's Terrence, yeah. baby. Yeah. yeah. And it's and it's perfect, you know. They say they can explain everything if you give them the one thing. But I mean, one you you are one alien abduction or a DMT experience away from throwing all of your belief systems out and saying, 
I don't think anyone's got it right. You know, you're like uh, religions across the world seem to all to be talking about the same thing, but each of them is such a stickler for their own, own personal belief system or agenda. The same as sciences, which is a dogma. Someone had brought that up earlier, mm-hmm. but, um, but none of them seem to be, I hate to use the stereotypical term open-minded about mm-hmm. it. They they want to be an authority figure on it, and anybody who is open enough to say, I don't know what the is going on, all of a sudden is somehow displaying a bit of weakness. And that's a problem that I think honestly should be addressed first and foremost, even before this UFO phenomenon, because until we get past that, we ain't gonna figure out anything else, you know? Right. Yeah. Yeah, there, there also seems to be an effect, and I think this is something that kind of recently caught on to. Um, you, you, I think it was uh, Spud Hopkins or John Mack or one of those guys in the 90s or the 80s who kind of made this really important point that said, you know, we're, we're, we're always focused on what, what the UFOs are or where the UFOs come from. Said so maybe we just need to shift our focus. Maybe we need to ask what the UFOs do, you know. Huh. We know they come to Earth, right? We vast majority of sightings have been on Earth or, you know, in the immediate orbit of Earth. It's a terrestrial phenomenon. It happens to humans. So why don't we ask the question, what does it do to people? You know, what is the effect on people? And mm-hmm. I think there's really interesting kind of questions that are opening up when you ask that. And I think one kind of conclusion I've drawn is that it seems to, uh, sort of like we were talking about earlier, it, it kind of makes a epistemological point. It kind of turns people against authorities or makes people question authorities. It makes right. people kind of look at reality anew from their direct experience, right, without right. relying on authorities. So, for example, <clears throat> the uh, air, uh, mystery airship phenomena, 1896 and 1897. And I should say I'm writing a book on that right now. It's a couple years out, uh, a couple years away from being released, but it will be called Flights ah. of Fancy. Uh. And um, but what I found in that is that the exact same kind of rift between you know scientists and authorities and witnesses um, opened up in that era just like opened up after 1947, right? After Kenneth Arnold and the flying saucers, it was always, uh, you know, it was the the Air Force officials and it was the the scientists and the skeptics of the time, like Donald Menzel, who were saying, this is all nonsense, this is hogwash, people are crazy, people aren't reliable observers, don't listen to them. You know, science tells you how the world works, it's a material universe, yada, 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 right? And all these people were saying, well, I don't know, that doesn't jive with my experience, that doesn't jive with the experience of hundreds and thousands of other people who said they saw these things. Right. The exact same dynamic is there in 1896 and 1897. They had all these professional astronomers commenting and saying, no, this can't be. This is ridiculous. This is a fad. Like, And yet all these people saying, well, I don't know. We saw it. You know, We saw it and hundreds of other people saw it and our entire town saw it. Right. Uh, so it, it's that's... Almost, it, yeah, it's almost like the, 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 the phenomenon kind of wants you to question authority, question established truth, and just sort of undermine them in a really subtle way. You know, just right. sort of turn people against them, just almost like they're trying to weaken their power over us, weaken the, the dominance right. of that ideology, right? It feels like, yeah, the the abductions and UFOs are the, the rage against the machine of the That's esoteric right. world, you know, That's just right. making you question authority, making you question everything, you know, and if that is the goal of them, I mean, my applause, because that is a beautiful thing, but, and and that really... Really, it helps to explain why the government today would finally be coming out saying that they want to admit that UFOs do exist, but then put their own spin on it, which is almost completely adjacent to everyone's actual personal experience. But when you have control of the media, you can spin it any way you want. And uh, speaking of which, well, actually, on that, I I wanted to ask you about there's a couple things now. I gotta let me backtrack before I get to uh, the the atomic bomb thing. Uh, we started setting off atomic bombs, and then the, the UFO started showing up, making me wonder if they actually are from Earth. But uh, just thinking about what you said a moment ago, you did two videos about disclosure that mm-hmm. are by far, I mean, easily I th- one of my favorite videos concerning the fact. And I, 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 it makes me wonder if those were the videos that maybe got you uh, 
a little bit in trouble with YouTube or I was sort of already in trouble with YouTube be well before okay. that. Like, it certainly didn't help. I'll say that. It certainly well, good. Help. Then we can talk about it here. And, and those are some of my most buried videos, by the way. If you look for those, oh my God, it's so hard to find them in the search results. Maybe things have changed by now, but I, I've tried looking for them myself and you, you have to almost, you know, put the entire title of the video to find that. So, well, uh, I have noticed that you don't have any shorts and, mm -hmm. uh, so shorts uh, often keep the long form videos in the algorithm, mm -hmm. but that's just, I mean, that's my personal take, but, um, so, but I want to talk about Tom DeLong and, uh, and the guy with the beard right there. Yeah. Um, first of all, don't trust either one of them. Never mm -hmm. have, never mm -hmm. will. I love Blink 182 mm -hmm. and I'll sing, yeah. I'll sing the songs. Yeah. But people are saying that he was a, a, a plant or an agent. I feel as if he didn't know any better. Yeah. I think he was recruited, basically. I think, you know, the CIA or whatever organization it was, that they, they know how to do this stuff. They know how to profile people, right? I think right. they sense a lot of things in them. They sense kind of maybe a bit of narcissism, um, you know, a, an intense passion, but maybe not the most kind of scholarly, you know, like... Dude, you're nailing it. You're you're fucking nailing it, bro. Yeah, that's yeah. And, and maybe you know delusions of grandeur, right? And they kind of said, "All right, well, this is the guy. This is the guy we can fool." And and, and we we to want to trust Tom DeLonge. We want to yeah. hug him and we want to serve him some ramen noodles yeah. and we want him to have a slumber party with us and make us laugh. Right. He's like our he's like everyone's hero who was our age. He is right. the perfect. Yeah. Cool. Absolutely. And he, you know, has a longstanding interest in, you know, some of his earliest songs are, you know, but, you know, aliens exist and all that stuff. Right. So yeah, he was, he was sort of perfect. And if you, if you listen, I think I include a bit of this in my video, but if you listen to his story about how, you know, he got involved in all this, first of all, he was, he was first approached about it at a, at a skunk works party. So it was always kind of a military weapons thing to begin with. I see. But, but um, he, there was one time he said he sat down with somebody, I can't remember where it was. I remember he said it was near an airport and it was some like, you know, Air Force general or something like that, some, you know, high up figure in the Air Force. And uh, like the scene he described was like out of a movie. You know, it was like a, a real quiet restaurant or something. The waitress kind of came up and did something at the table. And, uh, you know, the general just sort of like kind of waved her aside or, or waited for her to walk away and then just kind of leaned into DeLong and said something like, uh, I wish I remember the line exactly, but he said something like, you know, we found the bodies or something like that. You know, when he was talking about Roswell or he was talking about some UFO crash right. in the 40s. And, you know, so it made it feel like, oh, he, you know, he's finally letting me in on this secret, you know, and he's, he's whispering it in this restaurant. He doesn't want anybody here. And, you know, to someone like DeLong, they just, yeah, just have no real skepticism. They think, oh, my God, I'm being let in on all the secrets of the, of the U.S. government. I must be so important either. <laughs> and, uh, you know, basically just like appealing to his his narcissism and his um, delusions of grandeur. You know, they made him feel important. They made him feel like he was had this important mission bestowed on him. Right. So and, he, and he, he wanted to be the voice of UFOs. And in a way, he wasn't doing the wrong thing. He mm. what he thought I mean, he thought he was doing the right we're thing. Live for yeah, we're live right now, dude. We're talking about UFOs. Keep 62. up. 62. But um, <laughs> but it, it, it what's what occurs to me is, yeah, there's a movie element to it that keeps it exciting to Tom DeLonge so he can pass that excitement on. Mm -hmm. to the future generations, which is kind of futile considering, I mean, do you know who Blink-182 is? What the? See? Like, it, it, it ain't it ain't working. If they want... Is if this they, a crazy guy? If they get with... Uh, who's your favorite YouTuber? You. Yeah, okay. That's a good answer. <laughs> but, um, I don't know. Who's the big YouTuber? The big guy? He's everywhere. Mr. Beast? Mr. Beast. Mr. Beast. If they yeah, yeah. create Mr. Beast, they might have something, but mm -hmm. they, they're a generation short of, you know... Uh, what do you mean? Because we were already intuitively thinking about this Hold before on, Tom DeLonge that, came on the scene. We were skeptical skeptical that, of everything. What's up? You base some of what your videos off of. Hey, don't tell him that. Don't tell him that. <laughs> uh-oh. Mr. Beast has got some really good tips when it comes to uh <laughs> staying in the algorithm. I'll admit that. Right. But um so, because you you mentioned uh, in your so, I'm glad you watched the full Joe Rogan interview with Tom DeLonge because I Watch turned it off. Stuff. I turned it off whenever mm -hmm. Joe saw that video footage that was clearly animated, yeah, clearly yeah. animated. Oh, yeah, I was I was embarrassed and I turned it off. But you got to a point to where Joe Rogan was like, "Hey, have you actually seen these things?" And Tom was like, "No, no, yeah. they just tell me about them." 
Right. And you're like, dude, you got nothing. Yeah. That does not help us at all. Right. And furthermore, so, admitting that all these people he was talking to were still actively in the military or in the intelligence community, right? Right. I think I think all of them are, you know. So obviously there's you know, they're still sworn to their oaths and whatnot, oaths of secrecy. Like you have to ask yourself, why are they telling you all this stuff, right? If it's so secret, it's so important. Right. Why are they telling you? And if they if they truly told you something that's that's true, then they would be violating their oaths of secrecy and they would be right. punished for that. So you have to ask yourself, why aren't they being punished? Well, it's because they're lying to you, right? Right. So so what do you think about Bob Lazar in that case? Yeah, I'm also extremely skeptical of Bob Lazar. I mean, he certainly he he appears authentic. I, I kind of do believe he believes what he's saying. Right. Um, Same uh, as DeLong. Yeah, if, if I had to guess, I would say he's, um, he's uh, what's the word? He's a genuine, honest person. Uh, I think he probably did work at Area 51 uh, or wherever it was he said it was. That's I'm where not, aliens live. Not, not familiar with all the, the details. But, you know, if you listen to his story, he was only, I think, at that base for like a few days or something. I might be wrong on that, but it wasn't long. He right. Like exotic pets there. Um, yeah. He has this one story, basically, of being walked down this hallway. I think he has one story of, you know, seeing a supposed craft, like an alien ship and walking on board or whatever. But he never saw it fly or anything. Right. Uh, and then he, then he has another story of being walking down this hallway and they said they passed this door and there was a little window in the door. And as he just kind of cranked his head to the side and looked through this window as he's passing, he it sees a gray cool. alien sitting at a table being interviewed. And they didn't stop. They didn't let him get a good look. He just kind of caught a glimpse of it. So, again, that, that to me sounds like a setup. Like, first yeah. of all, if you're going to interview a gray alien in a top secret base, why would you have a window in the door? That, that's that a, that's no a sense. really good point. And, right. and at the same time, whenever they were interviewing people for his position when he was applying for the job, actually, he had gotten the job. It was more of an orientation thing. Right. They had put – they gave him reports that it was like a mixture of truth and falsities allegedly, according yeah. to him. By the way, and uh, Lazar also – is not shy about saying I might have been misinformed. I might mm -hmm. have been fooled. This is just what hey, I went through. There's another joke, and which also makes us uh, kind of believe him a little bit more, saying that if it is disinformation, right. he was a victim of it as much as right. we are. Right. But in, in they said that the the craft that they recovered were archaeological finds that allegedly came from Zeta Reticuli, which mm -hmm. I'm that over here wondering. If yeah. we, if they're an archaeological find, how do we know they're from Zeta Reticuli? But right. also, he insisted that we are containers. He just had his mouth open, <laughs> and that that um that seems to be the nugget of truth there, because I've mm -hmm. always kind of felt that way, as if human beings are containers for, I mean, call it whatever you want, uh, the the psyche, the spirit, the soul. Mm -hmm. But what Greys have to do with that? I, I'm not sure about. Can you quiet down? Mm -hmm. he, I'm he, not gonna. He, he can feel the vibrations. Remember, that's why he just opened his mouth. Welcome to my living room, bro. <laughs> We're a little unprofessional. Yeah, that's all right. Uh, this is cool. <laughs> but so this is what's his what's her name? Bite. This Bite. is Bite. Bite. I wanted to name uh, her Little Squeeze. Mm. Same thing with the other snake that we named Flash. <laughs> But he ended up being named something else instead. But uh, indeed, we do love our reptiles around here. And uh, this particular reptile, by the way, while we're on this note, hangs out with the kitties. We have two very loving kittens. Oh, wow. And we were told by everybody, do not mix mammals with reptiles. It will right. be, it'll end wrong. Avatar. Right, right. But uh, the cats produce heat. And this snake lays on the cats hmm. and to relax. Um, and we've got pictures of it and they get right. along absolutely great. But I nice. can't move my finger. But once uh, once she gets bigger, we might maybe restrict that a little bit right. more. Yeah. But, because um, we're going to be feeding her some rabbits. Uh, maybe. Don't say that on YouTube. They don't want us to. <laughs> that's not. We're not supposed to. What? Right? You're supposed to feed these things frozen mice now. Mm. So true story. We're going to get back to aliens, I promise. But side note, this is kind of funny. We went, I, I go to Petco to get mice for, mm. for this lady right here. We were on our way back and we happened to be going by PetSmart instead. And I said, we need a mouse. 
And she, the Don't lady was any. like, do you, uh, do you want to see the mice first so you can gather the personality that way you can find out what's best for you? And I was like, Oh no, 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 no. Give me uh just give me a mouse. And she was yeah. like, it's not a feeder. Is it? And she looked at me like, it's not a feeder. Is it? You yeah. wouldn't do that. Would you? And I was right. like, well, in food chain, that's mm-hmm. what they eat. And she was right. like, no, there's laws against that. No, there's not. There, well, I don't know if there is or not. That's what she said. But okay. I, uh, you know that uh, when this guy gets big enough, he eats like he's able to eat deer, right? Deer. Yeah. Okay, so no little kids allowed here. Yeah. <laughs> I right, hey, go play, go play video games. Love you, kiddo. We're... Uh. And also, I was just playing VR earlier, so. He lives in a VR. We live in a virtual reality as well. So it's a whole Russian doll of. Uh, yeah. That's right. It's off my finger. Good, buddy. Uh, yeah. But, but uh, around your neck. So where? Uh, so all right. Where? All right. That's right. That the next thing I wanted to bring up mad, was uh, uh, she likes your atomic though. bombs, right? So they <laughs> these things started showing up abundantly after we detonated an atomic bomb, and not that Y files need any more attention than they already have. But he hypothesized on one of his videos recently that these UFOs might not be from outer space, that that would be a deception in itself, Mm -hmm. that these things inhabited the Earth long before we did, which, I mean, kind of ties into Agartha even. But the, the big axiom goes that we know more about the moon than we do our own oceans, which is probably false. But it's a good way to angle this. What if these things are from Earth? Mm-hmm. And we're new. Right. Yeah, I mean, so first of all, in the whole atomic bomb hypothesis, I think that was originally posited by Stanton Friedman, a, a Canadian UFO researcher, one of the one of the earliest researchers. He was a nuclear physicist. And I think he made that point, or you know, he offered that as a suggestion. I tend to think that they didn't start showing up then. I think maybe maybe a wave began then. But I think okay. the reason we, we're aware of so many sightings from 47 onwards is because that was the first time, you know, the Kenneth Arnold had reported it to the Air Force. And that was the first time the Air Force acknowledged it. And all of a sudden, you know, the government was coming out and saying, hey, there's this there's this phenomenon known as flying saucers at the time. And they mentioned yeah. the UFO. So it's like they kind of introduced this concept, this category for people to put these anomalous experiences. OK, in. so, so co- correlation. Yeah. The, correlation versus causation. There could have been tons of sightings in 44, 45, 46. And in fact, there were. Um, mm. they, there were the Foo Fighters in World War II. I did a whole video on that. Right. Um, Allied and Axis pilots saw these little balls of light kind of flying around their planes and all sorts of different sightings throughout the war. Uh, there were the Ghost Rockets in Sweden in 1946, uh, which I... I've never done a video on it. I've never d- done any in-depth research, but people just kind of saw these like streaks through the sky, like rockets were kind of landing or something. By the way, you know, soon after the B-2 rocket had been introduced, interesting enough. So there, you know, there were these sightings before that, just people didn't have this category of UFO to kind of identify. Okay. So they said, well, you know, again, if you're that random farmer on the outskirts of town and you just see this weird thing in the sky, you go, I don't really know what to call that. I don't know how to make sense of it. There's no point in me telling anyone about it because what are they going to do with that information? I just saw a light in the sky, right? Right. Once the, once the Air Force comes up and says, hey, there's this phenomenon, you know, and we're, we're now collecting data on it. All of a sudden, all these people come out of the woodwork and start sharing their experiences. So I think yeah. it's maybe just a bit of illusion that, that, that you know, there was this big wave in 47. Um, that is, that's an incredible point. And I, I never looked at it from that angle before. Uh, once we invented the category of UFO, finally we got something to talk about, kind of like the color blue. We mm-hmm. didn't, we couldn't see it until we made a word for it. Right. And I mean, as above, so below, that makes perfect sense that people were seeing these things, but what do you even say until a language for it has been put into place? Right. That's I, kind I think of. In the past, most people would have interpreted that in some sort of religious light, right? They would have called it an omen or a, a sign in the sky or a wonder in the sky. Right. right? And, and they wouldn't necessarily report it. Why would you report a religious experience to a government official or to a scientific official, right? Right. So, yeah. Um, but um, there was another point I wanted to make. What was your question again about uh, the nuclear bomb thing? Oh, about where they come from, right? So, yeah, uh, as I said earlier, I think I consider the UFO phenomenon a terrestrial phenomenon. I mean, really? Well, I mean, why not? Every sighting has been on Earth, 
right? So, or, well, yeah, yeah. So what about, I mean, what about Carl Higdon? And I mean, okay, so he saw, and clear this up for me. He said in his report that he saw a blue ball, but mm -hmm. in his report, he didn't say it was the earth. Right. Yes. Do you think that's part of the deception or do you think that's a misunderstanding? Um, I think it's part of the deception. I see. Um, I just, you know, he was just kind of flashed this, this shot of the earth, supposedly right. from space, although I don't, he never said he saw stars or anything. He never did explicitly say it was in space. And he, yeah, like right. I said, he never said, explicitly said it was the earth. He just said, we're in a black void and there's this blue ball. And I'll say right. he's everywhere. You know, you like at Travis Walton, Travis Walton never saw anything in space from what I recall. He, he was abducted on earth and then woke up in what he assumed was a space station or a spaceship. But he never, a great point. You know, he never looked out a window and saw stars fly by and stuff. So, I mean, I don't know. Even if they do take us to space, they abduct us here on Earth, right? Right. And, and the sightings are here on Earth. So right. it's so weird that we constantly associate this with other planets when we've never seen a UFO on another planet. Right. You know, as far as we know, uh, extraterrestrial entities don't, don't even exist. We don't have any direct evidence of them. All we have is evidence of these things here on Earth. And again, right. you go back in time, you look at the fairy sightings. Well, there was no space association then. People that were adopted by fairies went to a, a, an alternate reality of some form. They never right. said they went into space. It's only recently that this kind of space association has been kind of put in there. And yes, I think that's kind of another bit of deception. Um, that is fascinating. We It happens on Earth and it ends on Earth. Mm -hmm. There is really no way to tie it to outer space. Yeah, and that know, reminds me of uh, of Edda Dorpa. Are are you familiar with uh, Inner or Earth or Agartha? No. So uh, there is a, a, a an ancient I only I don't want to say conspiracy, but uh, Shambhala is what it was called in Tibet. Uh, many other cultures call it Agartha, but the fact that there's pockets inside of the Earth, like a lava rock, right. and that there's surfaces and oceans, which we've proven there's oceans under the Earth. But basically that the earth is cavernous enough to wield civilizations. And in the book Edadorpa, where a man was taken by a secret society into the earth, uh, he, his guide was a, was a short gray man. Mm -hmm. And in his skin was wet like an amphibian, like a reptile. Mm -hmm. And now it's called a science fiction novel today. However, as Manly P. Hall had said it, that was the only way to have it published. Right. And it, it, and it makes me wonder, uh, somebody might argue that a star that is light years away is impossible to access unless you have some kind of wormhole technology of quantum entanglement that we can't even imagine at this point. But that being said... If there is something anomalous that is interacting with our civilization that is extremely advanced, the chances of it living in the oceans or within the Earth itself is far more likely. And in fact, if you're one to buy the Atlantean idea or ancient civilizations idea, I've argued before that as much as the Earth, the surface of Earth, gets bombarded with debris, solar flares, I mean, radiation, um, a countless amount of even other things that we don't even know about. The surface of Earth is naked and bare to the to the everything. Mm -hmm. a, 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 an extremely advanced civilization would most likely find it uh, more uh, more like they would go underground, like and and Darren Kuyu in Turkey. Tens of thousands. Well, this is this is not a conspiracy theory. We've proven that Darren Kuyu. In Turkey, they they grew crops underground. They mm -hmm. grew, they had cattle underground. Mm -hmm. Generations of people were born and died underground, mm -hmm. which seems impossible to us, but they did it because we we survived. They did it during the Younger Dryas era, allegedly. Mm -hmm. So, if you think about thousands of years before that, hundreds of thousands of years before that, dare I say, millions of years before that, going into the Earth. And uh, and perfecting your technology down there would almost make sense, considering that the surface is so rugged. And look at what grays look like. They don't have pigment, melanin in their skin. They're gray. Their mm -hmm. eyes are fucking huge. Mm -hmm. Their pupils are the entire eye. Right. Imagine what is the only animal on Earth that can see in pitch black. It's not an owl. 
an owl can see in the dark, but not in pitch black. The only animal that can see in pitch black is, is predatory reptiles. Hmm. It seems, and this is, I mean, merely speculation, that the greys are reptiles that have that were humans that went underground. At this point, I'm just putting, I'm just grabbing shit. Sure, but sure. I mean, but I mean, it's but why not? It's worth speculation because people talk about the greys are us from the future because of the muscle mass and everything. Mm-hmm. But the same thing holds if you take a human being and have them have babies, babies, babies for generations underground. They're going to lose pigment in their skin. Their eyes are going to get big and yeah. their muscle mass is going to reduce because of t- their own technology. Right. I don't know. Sure. Yeah. I think another thing you have to speculate is that they come from a, a different dimension. I mean, uh, yeah. So, big fan too. Know, for example, a lot of, um, a lot of UFOs will just sort of appear out of nowhere and disappear into nowhere. And in fact, I had a UFO sighting on my own back in uh, 2013. Really? My, yeah. From my parents' home farm. And uh, it was basically a point of light in the sky. I was with a friend. It was kind of a point of light in the sky that was just sort of moving around really erratically. Uh, eventually, we sort of lost sight of it, and it reappeared kind of lower in the horizon. And at that point, you could tell it was sort of a, a, an elliptical shape. It was very small. It was very far away. Maybe about you know, half the size of your pinky nail if you held it at arm's length. But See. you could tell there was an elliptical shape, and it was just sort of changing colors. Like the left would be green, the right would be white, and then all of a sudden it would be orange on the top and red on the bottom, and just shifting random colors randomly at random intervals. Wow. And we sort of watched it for maybe a minute there, and then it just disappeared. Like it didn't fly away. It didn't, you know, fly up towards Mars. It didn't fly underground. It didn't fly right. the ocean. It just disappeared. Right. So, you know, whatever, maybe that's some sort of, uh, you know, warp jump or something. Where they well, just- no, I mean, they, I mean I, I, if you leave a video game, if you yeah. unplug your, if you turn, uh, I, I, what's the, uh, if you unplug your controller, your character yeah. evaporates from the video game, right? right. I, there, right. People are going to yell at me for saying that. That's probably not right. Mm-hmm. But you can, I don't know, when you exit a video game, you fucking disappear. You don't right. leave the PlayStation 2. Right. In yeah. a linear, you know. So what if these beings, are, they exist outside of the hard drive that right. we live on? Yep. <clears throat> and that begs the question, what if they built the computer? Right. Yep. And that, you know, it's a potential explanation for how they're able to shift uh, forms. You know, they, they, right. they, it's sort of like plugging into the matrix or something. They can dress up however they want. They can bring whatever they want with them. You know? Right. Um, so they say, okay, now we're going to rural Peru. Uh, the Peruvians believe in, you know, this mythological creature or that mythological creature or, you know, their, their most popular example of, a, of an alien in their culture is, is this from this TV show. So we'll appear this way. Oh, next yeah. We're to, we're next, we're going to go to Toronto. Well, you know, they're big on this movie or that movie will appear this way to them. Um, That's it. And then yeah. that, that goes back to the creature of the Black Lagoon thing that you were just talking about. Yeah. Like this man is not lying, but he happened to see a frequent culture, uh, a frequent creature of, of pop culture. Yeah. That that helps kind of explain Grays a little bit. And if you go back to like the the sixties and seventies. The Greys were wearing like these silver leotard suits, right? Mm-hmm. And if you go back to like the forties, the uh, like the abductions, which were way more rare back then, they were wearing like helmets. Yeah, right. Yet or, there was or, still there was still evidence to con- concrete these people's uh, abductions reports, like the, the 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 ground turning to stone, um, trees becoming petrified or growing rapidly. Like there was physical evidence yet at the same time we discredit the count because they saw something that was from like a movie and even the the betty and barney hill abduction i I mentioned those gray like aliens people have pointed out that a very similar alien had appeared on i think it was um the outer limits i think that Mm. show was already going in the early 60s right and you can look at screenshots of it now it's like yeah that looks very similar to the being that barney betty and barney hill uh, saw so modern skeptics would take that and say, oh, well, they're just projecting what they saw from popular culture or they just had a, a dream or a nightmare inspired by popular culture. And that explains it all. It's nothing. But, right, I, you right. know, I think there's there's room for both. You can accept that they really did have a real experience and a real physical experience, perhaps. But also, you know, their their brains way of making sense of it or the way that the, the entities decided to appear through, through whatever technology or whatever processes they're using, they decided to appear like you know, like a creature that was familiar to the people they're abducting. 
Right. And I even hesitate to say decided to appear that way. I -hmm. almost wonder if whenever they encounter our consciousness, a mirroring effect takes place. And I wonder if they take on whatever form is best suitable for that particular situation. You know, um, if I'm going to go talk to Sonic the Hedgehog, I would appear as a hedgehog or not mm. hedgehog, but that type of character, you know, that, that would be enough. Uh, uh, Barney Hill saw Nazis, by the way, did you ever read that? Yeah. He, well, he said beings that moved like they were Nazis. Like, he just said they moved with like kind of a military discipline. Oh, I see. Something. Okay. He didn't see like a swastika on the arm or something. I like don't that. think so. It might've saw black suits or something. I can't, I can't remember the details right now, but I think it was mostly just, he said they, they moved like they, they were military figures or something. Right. Right. I, what I found to be fascinating about that case amongst other things, um, was that they came into the room of Barney after they separated the two, they started pulling on his teeth Yeah, and they were confused. His teeth right. wouldn't come out. Right. And then whenever they had regressive hypnosis later, it was found mm. that when they pulled out Betty's teeth and they were dentures, mm-hmm. it was such a strange, absurd, another, again, absurdity of something that, if they conspired to make that up, they had to come down to that particular detail, right. which is absurd within itself. And right. uh, another little obsession of mine was Betty's star map, which mm-hmm. ag- it goes completely against my own hypothesis about them, about Agartha and being from the oceans. But it's still worth noting that when she presented her star map to astrologers, they said, no, that's not what the stars look like there. And then it wasn't, I think it was Carl Sagan. Uh, let me retract that because I'm not sure it was him, but it was somebody notable who was like, okay, yeah, that's not what the stars look like from here. But if you go over here from a sidereal <laughs> point of view, that is what the stars look like. And she was confirmed to have drawn an accurate star map from the opposite side of the galaxy. Right. That is something where I my skepticism slowly starts to go out the window because she didn't have that kind of education, you know, that, and I, I listened to the entire, the entire interview with Barney Hill, Mm -hmm. this, this big man crying tears. I mean, uh, uh, if you have, if anyone gets a chance, listen to Barney Hill's, testimony while he was under regressive his hypnosis the fear in his voice mm-hmm. not acting not acting that i've ever seen mm-hmm. yeah i agree yeah i think but, I, it was a woman named marjorie fisher i think who did the star map thing carl sagan actually debunked it he he, he pulled it out as an example of why he was all nonsense or something but i see i mean okay. there are problems with it you know I, i'm a little skeptical of the star map i mean a you have to assume that she remembered it she was actually reproduced it as she remembered it I mean, if someone showed you a, a star map, right, just flashed it to you for a second, and then someone asked you to draw it five days later, would you be able to reproduce every single point exactly as you saw it? Not a chance. You know, and, and even if you assume she did reproduce it accurately, well, man, the universe is a big place. And, you know, if you want to tr- find some particular constellation of stars, I mean, somewhere out there, there's going to be that particular constellation. Okay. Viewed, viewed from the right angle, right? So sure. I, mean, I think it was interesting work. I think it was cool that that someone did try to verify that star map, but right. you kind of have to make a lot of assumptions to assume that that's, you know, right. That's really where that it was from. But anyway, there's as many holes in it as there are answers. Right. And again, not, not, I'm not, not trying to say that Betty Hill was lying. Anyway, I think she did her best to remember what she saw, but right. You know, yeah. It, how, how fallible is the memory? No, you, you bring up an interesting point because, um, I, I do that with myself a lot when it comes to, uh, whenever I, read a big a, a, someone who saw bigfoot let's say and mm-hmm. they recount all the little details of what bigfoot looked his sloped forehead he had uh the, the ears were, were recessed blah 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 the the upper lip had the little poof or whatever and I, I think about like if i just saw a jaguar walk across my house right mm-hmm. and someone asked me to reproduce the spots on him or all these little details i don't i would not be able to do that so no. it it is suspicious when someone's got too many details mm. it makes you it makes you wonder like if you're in this 
situation where you're seeing something truly bizarre, you mm. are not in the mindset to be like, you know, taking right. mental notes, you yeah. know? Yeah. Yeah. Especially but, after uh, so much distress, right? Right. Right. Yeah. You were going to say something else about the Betty and Barney case though. Uh, right before uh, the star map thing. Um, I'm not sure I was going to say something about that. A, a, a point I did want to make, um, just talking about, you know, the way these beings appear and whatnot. Uh, I, I did a video on a case called the Sandown Ghost Clown. And uh, I don't know, I think it's one of my favorite cases. Um, very bizarre. From the 70s, again, early 70s, I believe. I think it was 73, on the Isle of Wight near England. And there's a couple kids. I think they were both about seven years old. And uh, basically, they just sort of wandered away from their home. They heard this, like, wailing sound, like a siren. And uh, end up seeing this creature, like, crawl out from under a bridge, splashing around in the water. And it was just the most bizarre creature you can imagine. It looked like kind of a cross between a scarecrow and a clown. It had like this, this covering over its head that kind of went down around its neck. It's like pointed kind of hat thing. Its face looked like it had an almost clown makeup on, although its face didn't move. It, it talked, but its lips never moved or anything. Blue gloves on, and it had like looked like straw protruding from its wrists, from its sleeves, and straw right. protruding from its pant legs. It had all these tears and holes in its clothing. And uh, it just kind of brought these kids into this metal shack and like did this magic trick for them, and then and then they just sort of left and it said goodbye. It's the creepiest sort of shit ending. I've ever heard, bro. Oh, it's the one of the weirdest stories in the world, and it's just very eerie, just in, in how strange it was. But at some point in doing the research, I realized it was based on the scarecrow from The Wizard of Oz. You know, if you look at the scarecrow from The Wizard of Oz, he's got holes in all his clothes. He's got the straw protruding from the sleeves. He's got the the pointed hat and the thing around his neck and all that. And it's kind of a right. I mean, it's, similarities are, are are striking. Right. And then you realize, okay, well, you know, let's say a being were trying to appear to children, remember seven year old kids, and not freak them out. Well, you know, what do kids like? You know, if you look around, assume you're an alien, you're you know studying human behavior. You look around with groups of kids. Well, what frequently appears at, at, at where groups of kids are? Clowns, right? right? Yeah. Um, you know, how many birthday parties in that era had, you know, clowns show up, right? Right. Or Scarecrow. That was another kind of common motif in, you know, Halloween decorations and whatnot, or kids dressing up as Scarecrows for Halloween. So it, it, I just kind of assume it read our popular culture in some way. Didn't necessarily understand what a Scarecrow was. Didn't necessarily understand what a clown was, but realized right. that both of them were so, sort of associated with children. And the it it, it obviously out. didn't see the movie It yet. <laughs> right, right. But had that been out in 73? I, I, I think that movie's a little newer, right? So but anyway. It, right, right. Well, it right. was you know, obviously before that, you know. But so this this being seemed to take on the amalgamation of clowns, scarecrows, and any, anything else that would be amiable to children in order to not let them run. So what was this being's message to the children? What was the... It didn't really have one. They just kind of asked it some questions. Okay. It said, like a fairy uh, thing. Yeah. Like, it said, oh, uh, there, there is more than you think. It said, well, it had a really in, in cryptic message. It introduced itself. It said, I am all colors, Sam. Um, yeah. Hello. It said, hello. And I am all colors, Sam. I think is the word for word introduction. Dude, that's creepy, bro. Uh, it's super creepy. And what does that mean? What do you mean? All colors, Sam, you know? And then they asked it. They said, oh, are you a man? And it said, no. They said, oh, are you a ghost? And it said, well, no, but in a way, sort of, or something like that. So it, it, very ambiguous. They asked it directly what it was, and it kind of didn't answer the question, right? It right. said that there were others like it around. It said that it avoided humans because it was afraid of getting hurt. Like I said, it, it did this kind of magic trick for them. And then they said, okay, well, we got to go. And said, all right, bye. Um, so again, one of those cases where it's like, well, it's so ambiguous. It's so ambivalent. Like, you know, what was even the point of that? That's, but that's where high can, strangeness turns to absurdity right there. Yeah, one thing you can definitely say though is I'm sure those kids left that that encounter with a lot of questions, right? Probably thought about the world, the physical universe, consciousness in a very different I, way after that, right? Am I frozen on your screen? You are. You just have a black screen. I don't see you at all. It's black. Yeah. Oh, uh, Dustin. Dustin keeps calling me on Facebook Messenger. I use my phone for these things, guys. Come on. Uh, on my screen, I'm completely frozen. Uh it, it, can you guys, uh, who, who, we're nearing the end here. I hate to end it like this. I mean, uh, uh, yeah, Static and Wonderland, what do you see on my side here? And yeah, Sasquatch is inter <laughs> interdimensional. <laughs> it's black. Yeah. 
Are you still there? I, I, and oh, I really, yeah. I, I apologize for the <laughs> not being so much professional, but this is kind of a, you know, small potatoes channel We're, going on here. And Joe, clap twice if you were abducted. <laughs> Do you need us to rescue well, you? I, I, I am abducted by Dustin Windhorse, who keeps calling me right now during this, and I suppose doesn't know that I'm live. Can you hear me right now? We can. I can hear you. All right. Well. <laughs> I, I suppose uh, now would be a good time for some closing remarks, I guess. But uh, let me uh, – this was going to be my closing question to you is that I'm going to be working on a couple videos in the near future about the absurdities of UFOs and aliens that you would give advice to me or something that you haven't covered yet that you think is very interesting. Uh, I lost you for a few seconds, but I think you, you just asked me for suggestions on cases, right? Yeah, yeah. Is there anything that you haven't covered yet or that you find to be highly interesting that you think needs to be out there? What would you say? Oh, boy. Um, putting me on the spot. Um, <laughs> Sorry. I mean, so many good ones. Um, Pascagoula abduction. Are you familiar with that one? I am not, but... Pas Pascagoula, Mississippi, 1973. Another very bizarre case. Very very much like the Higdon case. Really? Perfect. Yeah. Um, oh, boy. Um, I mean, there's so many that I haven't looked into myself. Actually, people suggest suggest topics to me all the time on, on, on my channel and you know, I, I can only get around to so many. Um, dude. Yeah. Oh, I, same world over here, dude. Uh, I, I, I've got a list of 30 things suggested that I need to get into. And I'm telling you, man, uh, I, every time I get a new list of suggestions, I mean, dude, most of them are good yeah. are real good. And these, the, the guys in both of our communities are, these people are people, they know what they're talking about and they've done the research too. Uh, maybe not as in depth as you have, or some of us uh, YouTubers have, but man, whenever a good story comes across them, they, uh, they know who to call out to. And, uh, yeah. I wish I could cover every single one of them that we get suggested, but you well, know, the, the sand down ghost clown was a suggestion from a, a subscriber and I checked it out just recently. It's one I didn't know about a couple of years ago. So right. I would recommend checking out that one. That one's super interesting. Right on, man. Just, well, I, I always like those cases, right, where they're not easily categorized, right? They're, they're not your typical gray mm -hmm. alien They're not your typical ghost sighting. They're right. sort of halfway between both. Those are the ones that really kind of make me scratch my head. I find them really interesting. That's what I've noticed about your channel, man, is that you, you are breaking the mold on these human-imposed uh, uh, categories of what uh, particular things here are there and there. Because, like, honestly, when it comes to an, the anomalists, we can categorize all we want, but what we're doing is creating those categories and in a way working ourselves in reverse when it comes to understanding things. Because when it comes to things that we don't understand, we have to think abstractly and, and putting these things into categories does not necessarily work for that, you know. Mm -hmm. But uh, I, I think that is a good closing mark there. And uh, sorry about the technical difficulties, man. Okay. But, uh, no problem at all. To everybody watching, check out Think Anomalist. It's it's a great middle ground of both education and entertainment. Wonderful channel, bro. And uh, hopefully I'll talk to you again soon. All right. That'd be great. I'd be happy to come back. Thanks so much for having me. Thanks, bro. See ya. All right. Bye-bye.